to go. We'll get underway. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to the Lubar Center, Eckstein Hall at Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing interesting and important work in this region and beyond. Today we are joined by Rick Graber. He has been the president and CEO of the Bradley Foundation since 1916. Before that, he was a senior vice president at Honeywell. Did I say 1916? <laughs> He looks remarkably youthful, doesn't he? <laughs> remarkably youthful. Since 2016. You're paying attention, I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Before he took the job in 2016, uh, Rick was senior vice president at Honeywell International, where he led the company's worldwide government relations initiatives. He is also a former U.S. ambassador to the Czech Republic. 2006 to 2009, he worked in the administration of George W. Bush. He is an attorney, practiced law at uh, Reinhardt Berner Van Duren in Milwaukee, eventually became president and CEO of that law firm. And he is also a former uh, chairman of the State Republican Party, which is where I think we got to know each other from. I think so. Our, our, my days covering politics and your days uh, participating in it. So again, please welcome Rick Graber to Marquette Law School. Good afternoon. So uh, I want to begin uh, by uh, asking you about why you took this job, because you've had a, a, a pretty, uh, as we just saw, a pretty uh, interesting uh, career. What was attractive to you about the job at the Bradley Foundation? You know, we had been gone from Milwaukee for almost 10 years, living in Prague and then with Honeywell. We lived in Brussels and then later Washington, D.C., and I didn't really think that uh, we would find our way back to Milwaukee. Uh, I served on the Bradley Foundation board uh, prior to taking my current role, but still I didn't think we'd come back to Milwaukee. But then the opportunity came up, Mike Grebe retired, uh, who had served as president of the Bradley Foundation for 15 years. And I thought, what an incredible opportunity, what a unique opportunity to be a steward of this wonderful endowment left to us by the Bradley brothers uh, through their work at the Allen Bradley Company. Uh, totally different than anything I've ever tried to mm -hmm. do before in my, in my career, but, but what an opportunity to, to make a difference, both locally and nationally. Uh, it's a unique job, it's a unique place, and it's right here in Milwaukee. And my wife and I sat down and thought about it, and before we knew it, we were headed back to, we are headed back home, back to Milwaukee. I was reminded uh, on Tuesday, we had Kelly Thompson here, she is the state public defender, and she, uh, as we were Beginning the interview, I asked her about why she had chosen to become a state uh, public defender, work in the public defender's office, and she had mentioned her dad. She did not mention him by name, and I, point, I pointed out that her dad had been the former governor, Tommy G. Thompson. And so uh, I was surprised how many people in the room didn't know that. And so what I thought might be helpful today is to actually talk a bit about the history of the Bradley Foundation, how it began. Uh, give us, give us a, a brief uh, summary uh, sure. of how this all started. Sure. Uh, starts with two brothers, Lyndon and Harry Bradley, who grew up in the late 1800s, early 1900s on the east side of Milwaukee. They lived on Prospect. Uh, neither of them were college graduates. Uh, and they were tinkerers. They uh, invented. They, they loved doing things. And through lots of starts and stops and successes and failures, they created a really amazing company that anyone who has spent any time in Milwaukee knows about, the Allen Bradley Company. Uh, and uh, ultimately, when that company sold in the mid-1980s, and this is long after Lyndon and Harry had uh, mm -hmm. passed away. Uh, Lyndon Bradley passed away in the 1940s, Harry Bradley in the mid-1960s. So it was sometime after that that the company was actually sold to Rockwell. But it was that event, the, the sale of the company, that created a lot of cash. It was, it was a $1.6 or $7 billion sale of a private company, which, which was huge in the mid-1980s, and, and a portion of that cash moved into what we know today as the Bradley Foundation. So the foundation really started in 1985. Uh, we have an endowment today of uh, uh, approximately $900 million, so it's a, it's a big amount of cash, and we're able to, to, to distribute 40 to $50 million a year to worthy organizations both here and all over the country. Uh, how much of it goes into the, to the local area? Uh, historically, uh, at least 30% a year. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there have been lots of conversations and fears over the years that, that the Bradley Foundation money might focus exclusively on national, and that, 
that can't and shouldn't be the case. Uh, our job at the Bradley Foundation as, as staff uh, are to be stewards of what the Bradleys would have wanted. They cared deeply about the city of Milwaukee, about the problems in the city of Milwaukee. They cared about education here. Uh, they cared deeply about their employees. So I think it's very, very important that the Bradley Foundation resources, a, a very healthy chunk, mm -hmm. uh, remain in Milwaukee, remain in Wisconsin forever. So we're talking really $12 million, $15 million yes. a year staying in this area. Yes. Since the foundation yeah. was created yeah. in the mid-1980s, I, I think over $400 million mm -hmm. uh, have been donated out, have been granted to worthy organizations in the city and the state. So give us a sense of, of how the foundation views its mission today. Uh, how would you describe the mission? Well, our mission, as stated, is to restore, strengthen, and protect the principles and institutions that uh, have made this country unique and exceptional. The challenge, of course, is to define, all right, what does that mean yeah. in, in practice? And we've defined it in four ways. Uh, we're, we're looking for organizations, and we're a funder. We give money away. We're, we're looking for organizations that are loyal to our Constitution, to our, our system of uh, separation of powers, of federalism, of individual liberties. Uh, we're looking for organizations that are committed to free markets that uh, do what the Bradley brothers did. They were entrepreneurs, private enterprise, uh, voluntary exchange within the rule of law. We have a big commitment to uh, an informed citizenry, and that has translated into a lot of the work that we've done in, in the education area, K through 12, and also higher education. Uh, and then finally, a, a strong emphasis on a strong civil society, the fundamental institutions of civil society that truly have made a difference in this country and I think have made this country exceptional. And by that, I'm talking about basic things, families, neighborhoods, churches, uh, volunteer organizations, uh, things that don't involve the government, that involve the limited government. And we do all this again because it's, it's our job to do what the Bradley brothers would have done themselves were they still here. And, and you look back at their careers and, and you can see, as I mentioned, the way they treated their employees. They believed in the, the dignity of every single person and the dignity of work. Uh, they believed in uh, political and economic freedom, that they were able to accomplish what they accomplished uh, in an environment where they could succeed and they could fail and then come back and do great things. I want to put a face on, on uh, some of the uh, giving uh, that the Bradley Foundation does. And I, I think many people in the room uh, might have some idea of, of how you spend your money, but, but you spend a lot on the arts and on culture in this community. Uh, the Milwaukee Ballet, the Symphony, uh, organizations like that. Why? As part of that civil society component, the, the Bradley brothers and their wives uh, Peg and Caroline Bradley, believed that it was a really important component of a strong society and a strong community and felt very, very strongly about that. Uh, so that's why we have supported uh, many, many, if not all of the arts groups uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, we're supporting the, the film festival. Yeah, I, I thought that was interesting. Why, why, do you, why is the film festival worthy of, of it's support? Really, it's, it's really neat. It's a community gathering. People are coming together and, and talking about ideas. Um, I'm sure there are many of the films that are produced that might not line up precisely with the Bradley Foundation's <laughs> philosophy, uh, but that's okay. It's, it's a stronger civil society. We have a very significant commitment to the Milwaukee Symphony uh, in, in helping them with, with their new home, which I think is really exciting on West Wisconsin Avenue. We all know that that's been a tough stretch in this city to make work. And we, yes, we are doing it because of the symphony, but yes, we are also doing it for what we think it can do for that part of the city of Milwaukee. You support a number of uh, community organizations as well, not just the arts, but community organizations. I was struck, uh, uh, and when you give your yearly report, you talk about where the money's going, but I was struck by, uh, you know, a, a group like the, the uh, I think it's called the Alma Center, which uh, does work with, um, on the issue of domestic violence. Yes. What, what appeals to you about an organization like that? Why does that fit within this, this framework? Civil society, again, it's uh, one of the most significant problems we have in our society today is the breakdown of family. Uh, what the Alma Center does, and they do some incredible things there, are work with men 
who have been engaged in domestic violence. And, and it's a way uh, to bring those people back into our society, hopefully bring them back with their family uh, in a way that can be very powerful. Again, the dignity of every single person, the dignity that comes with work, uh, all of that works together. And it's, it's really been one of the exciting things for me coming back to Milwaukee is to be able to spend some time with some of these organizations. It's, uh, it's not government that is largely solving the, the very, very difficult problems we have. It's these unsung heroes in our community who every day go to work and sort of one person at a time try to make our society, make our community a little bit better. It's the Alma Center, it's the, it's the folks at uh, Running Rebels that are de dealing with uh, kids coming out of the justice system. Um, it, it's Axe Housing, an incredible organization that is uh, enabling first time homeowners to own a home mm -hmm. as opposed to rent and it's often cheaper owning a home than renting a home. ACTS, not ACTS. Axe, ACTS. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, so ex exciting organizations like that. Operation Dream, <coughs> again, mentoring young kids one on one. There's so many of these, often small. You don't read about them in the newspaper. They're making an enormous difference. Um, and again, I, why do we do it? It's what the it's what the brothers would have wanted. And, and, the importance they placed on family and community. Do you think, uh, as a general observation, do you think civil society in America is fraying? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it, it's all these points that, that I've been making, that, that there's a breakdown of community. Maybe it's technology and people are spending more time looking at a phone <laughs> than talking to their neighbor. Um, there's a polarization that I think that we, we see not only in this community but all over the country on, on politics. There's uh, people aren't talking to people. Um, from Bradley's perspective, there's too much reliance on government to try to fill this this void. Whereas we think that's not the right place to solve problems. We think it's people helping people through private voluntary organizations that probably don't have any government funding at all. Um, so yeah, it's the big, it, it is a massive problem and we, we talk about education and the problems there uh, in, in K through 12 and, and, and the experiences there. It's all bound up together though. It's not just the education problem. The civil society, the breakdown of the family is part of this problem, a big part of this problem. You, you mentioned well. government. Is there a role for government in helping build a civil society? I, th I think there is a role for government. I think a limited role is what the founders intended and what the Bradley Foundation supports. I don't think government has proven to be a very good fixer uh, of poverty or the problems facing our community. I think if you just look around our own community here, you'll see that the groups that are, are making a difference, that are making a change, have very little to do with government. I ask that because, you know, and I'm sure you hear this, the, the pushback is, is that uh, if we just leave it to the markets and we just leave it to free enterprise, sometimes the people's problems don't get addressed. And that um, uh, the New Deal was an attempt to address that. Government stepped in where things, I, 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 and, right. or, or even, even you go all the way back to Milwaukee's uh, socialist mayors who cleaned up the environment and, and addressed public health issues because they were not being addressed, that there is a role for government. And, and that's sort of the but pushback. I'm not here. advocating yeah. no government. I think there is a role for government dealing with those people in our society that need help. Mm -hmm. um, what I am saying is that the private voluntary organizations out there ultimately can do a better job or can supplement what government can do in terms of bringing people back into our society, uh, back to work, uh, and, and the dignity that comes with that. I want to talk about some of the things that uh, uh, the organization is, is very involved in and has been, historically speaking. I remember covering Michael Joyce when he was the head of the Bradley Foundation, and one of uh, the issues that was very important to him was uh, school choice. Very important. And it remains a, a high priority for the Bradley Foundation. Why is yes. that? Yes, yes. 
having an informed citizenry, civil society. We keep coming back to these themes that sort of overlap with each other. Uh, it, it, it has been a signature issue for the Bradley Foundation, and really the philosophy of, of the foundation has always been when it comes to education that uh, parents know best uh, for their kids. And, and we encourage as many different options as a parent can possibly have in finding the right situation for their child. They know better than any government bureaucrat. Wherever you are, whatever zip code you're in, those parents know better than a bureaucrat on what's best for their kids. So if, if that's a public school, great. If it's a private voucher school, that's great. If it's a charter school, homeschooling, the more options, the better. Uh, and Milwaukee has really been one of the leading laboratories in the country on this. And, and it's, it's interesting, 35 years later, what's happened uh, in this community with now I think Alan Borsick's column said 40 to 50 percent of the kids in Milwaukee don't go to a traditional public school. That's okay. And, and you're starting to see some uh, differentiation between the results produced out of kids going to, to choice and charter schools as opposed to those going to public school. Uh, tough issue, but uh, the, the problems are pretty identifiable. There's a shortage of talent teacher talent and administrative talent, some great organizations here in Milwaukee working on it, Center for Urban Teaching. There are some incredible schools that, that are teaching kids that come from really, really tough backgrounds. Uh, St. Marcus, Milwaukee Excellence, Milwaukee Academy of Science, uh, Ricardo Schools. Uh, uh, just some incredible educators that every day are tackling these challenges and succeeding. So we as a community ought to be finding ways to, to celebrate those successes instead of engage in the arguments that seem to happen here and find ways to put the kids first. I think, I think too often the kids aren't coming first in this equation. And when we have a situation where kids are getting a, that kind of education, it sent Marcus and other places, schools I mentioned, and many others. Um, how can we make that better? How, how can we expand that opportunity uh, as opposed to this decades-long argument of, uh, you know, every, everything, every alternative is bad for the public schools? We want a strong public school system. Absolutely. We should. But they should have to compete and they should have to measure up. And if parents have that choice, good for them. Uh, has it been? <laughs> has it been? Um, has it been? Not a, everyone agrees with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> has it been a, a, a game changer? And, and, and you mentioned, and I ask this because you mentioned that there are some numbers now that suggest progress is being made. Yeah. But 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 let me try and capsulize this, and there may be people who will disagree with me, but but I'll try and do this briefly. Uh, standardized test scores for MPS students and voucher school students, pretty similar. Um, high school graduation rate, a little bit higher for voucher kids. More voucher students going on to college, but not completing college. No difference between the study I saw in 2018, Witte, um, who's done other work. Um, no difference in graduation between MPS and college, graduation between MPS and voucher students. Is the difference significant enough? to warrant the program at this point in its history. Absolutely. Um, again. Because parents put, want that? Putting the, in part, yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it should be the parent's choice where, the, where they go. Um, there's a big focus on test scores. Uh, and, and the evidence is increasingly clear that there is a difference in language proficiency, English language uh, testing and math proficiency, uh, and, and so forth. But I think it goes beyond just test scores. I think part of it is graduation. I think part of it is going to college, although I don't necessarily think that everyone should go to college. Um, but it's part of being a citizen. There is evidence that, that kids coming out of the, the, the choice and charter programs are um, more engaged in their communities, are staying out of the, civil or the criminal justice system, that they're becoming better, more contributing citizens. Now, when I say all this, some are going to interpret this, well, you're, you're against public schools. That's not what I am saying. But is it fair for public schools to have to compete? Uh, absolutely. The more competition, you're going to get better results, better teaching, 
Uh, and, and in the end, as I said at the end of the day, it's, it's with the kids. And that's what we need in this community, better education for more kids um, every single year. Uh, the uh, school choice program at Wisconsin had an advocate and a strong supporter uh, in Madison in Governor Walker. Yes. Uh, Governor Evers has, uh, including in this, in this building, expressed a little bit uh, more nuanced approach, I would say, to uh, the voucher program. Uh, he is less Question. enthusiastic about it. Right. Uh, are you concerned that uh, with a different governor in Madison, that sure. the, the program might I don't think it's going look away. differently? In I, don't, I don't think it's going away. I, I think after 35 years, it's, it's part of the scene here uh, in Wisconsin and, and in Milwaukee, and the numbers keep going up. But do I think we can make the kinds of progress that I would like to see with Governor Evers in office? No, I don't. I don't. I think it's a bit of a roadblock. Um, I think it's unfortunate, again, because I don't think it's putting kids first. Uh, we'll keep doing what we do and what Bradley Foundation does. I was in the world of politics. What the foundation does is, is much different. It's a much longer term play. So the politicians come and go. People are in office. They're out of office. Uh, we keep working on these policy issues year after year, regardless of who's there, um, and, and, and are a very steady force in that, in that regard. So let me ask you uh, the question that I'm sure some people in this room, depending on their politics, want me to ask. You know, do you feel like you are a lightning rod in, in today's political discourse, not just yeah. in Wisconsin, but in, even around the country? Has the Bradley Foundation become that? How do you feel about that? <laughs> well, if you Google Bradley Foundation, uh, <laughs> There's some less than flattering things said. Uh, I mean, we're accused of all kinds of things, and I guess it comes with the territory. I don't think it's fair. Uh, I mean, you, you read about the fact that somehow we're, we're evil right-wing money. Um, dark money is, is a term that you often read, but we are very, very transparent about who we give our, our resources to. If you go on our website after every quarter, you can see who we gave money to in the last quarter. There are no secrets uh, about what the Bradley Foundation does or what the Bradley Foundation stands for. Uh, I, I do think we're in a world today where it is, it is more difficult to talk about ideas, and it's more difficult for a variety of reasons to um, uh, get past the polarization and, and the, the emotional, you know, you're evil, as opposed to just sitting down and talking about some of these things. Um, we have an obligation at the foundation, again, to follow our donor intent uh, and, and, to, uh, and we believe uh, in what the Bradley brothers believed in. It's hard, obviously, to translate that to 40, 50 years later, uh, but, but we're in the world of ideas um, and we fund organizations that are in the world of ideas. Some of them are controversial, some people won't agree with, that's fine. So like think tanks or legal tank, centers sure. or conservative media sure. or things we, like we, that? We do all of that. Uh, uh, we get outspent on the other side of things. Uh, and it's clear that uh, more, much more money is spent on, on the other side of that spectrum than, than, than we're able to provide. But yes, we do fund policy tanks. We fund uh, state-based think tanks, <coughs> state-based legal centers. Uh, journalistic endeavors, yes, to try to get the, the ideas out. And, and do you feel, I, I, I assume, the reason why you fund those is you don't feel the ideas are either getting fair coverage or fair analysis or are not getting heard in the way that you feel they deserve to be heard? Is that, is that sort of the, the, well, the reasoning behind that? You know, and this, it's one of the great things about this country. Uh, I mean, democracies are messy. They're inherently messy. Uh, it is much easier in today's world to get ideas out there. In some ways, it might be more difficult to try to synthesize all those ideas. So I don't know if it's a matter of fairness, but there's a competition for ideas. You can see it in, in the elections right now. There, there's a much different view of what this country should look like. Uh, there's, there's a great debate on, on my side of thinking in the, in the conservative movement world uh, about what it means to be a conservative. Watching the presidential debates, there's obviously a great debate on the left side, too, about what this country should be. Should this be a society of uh, entrepreneurship and limited government and uh, capitalism uh, and the opportunities that come with that? Or should it be more government-dominated, more socialist? 
uh, leanings that we hear from Senator Sanders and Senator Warren and others. Uh, just as I tried to put a face on some of the organizations earlier, um, you know, I, I want to uh, do the same here, uh, like, and we see some of our friends from Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty in the room. Right. Um, that's been a very uh, important uh, organization uh, for Bradley. Great, um, great organization. Why, why, for example, and this is not meant in a hostile way at all, why, why is that an organization that you feel needs to exist and that you need to fund? Well, I mean, we, we think it's important, and this isn't a secret strategy by any means, we think it's important to have a, uh, it, we call it a permanent freedom infrastructure in the states. And again, we've been very public about this. Uh, Will provides that service. There are some other organizations in this state, such as Badger Institute, such as McIver, mm -hmm. uh, that from a think tank perspective or, or more of a, a, a public relations perspective have roles to play. Uh, people on the other side of the, the equation are, are, are doing the same thing. So it, it's a way, again, to get your ideas, your thoughts out there in the public Marketplace, Will has been a very, very successful organization. We're funding organizations like Will all over the country. Yeah, I was going to say, are there ideas that, that have been tried in Wisconsin that do uh, extrapolate into other states? Is that well, a... I think, yeah. I think uh, Rick and his team at, at Will have been a great example. Rick for Essenberg. Others. Mm -hmm. Rick Essenberg, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the president of Will. Um, but by the same token, I think the guys at Will would say that they've, they've learned from things going on in other states, uh, states that politically in, in recent times have been much more difficult than uh, Wisconsin for Republicans or, or conservatives in this case. I'd, I'd cite Pennsylvania and Illinois as uh, cases where very Democrat dominated, but a very strong infrastructure in place. Yeah, so, so it would be fair to say that that is part of the goal here to build sort of a, I guess a conservative inf infrastructure, a com conservative ecosystem that can exist in, in Wisconsin, can exist in other places as well. Well, yeah, and, and you look around the country, there's, I mean, Washington, whatever side you're coming from, I think you can agree is somewhat of a mess. Uh, and, and not a whole lot is going on there in terms of substantive problem solving. Where the action is, and, and really where the laboratory of democracy is now, are, are, are in the states. So focusing on the states, focusing on what's going on on the ground um, is, is really important. I want to talk about, uh, to quote uh, a former boss of yours, I want to talk about the vision thing, or at least a family <laughs> member of your boss. Um, so this is a funny comment that I read, uh, uh, and it's a, it's a compliment. It came from an unlikely source. It was Mike Tate, the former uh, Democratic Party chairman yes. in this state, yes. who said several years ago about the Bradley Foundation is that they have a 15 to 20 year vision, and they're executing it. Is he right? We're trying. We're trying. Um, do you try and think that far well, down the I road? Don't, can I, you look I don't, I don't know that you can road? look 15 years down the road. Um, we, we, we have a strategic plan. Uh, we, we look at our strategic plan every day. Uh, we tweak our plan as, as circumstances require, and we try to be disciplined in what we do. And again, it, there are no secrets. Just look online, and, and you'll know exactly what the Bradley Foundation is doing. Um, and we're doing it because we think it, it is a better society uh, for all Americans uh, along the lines that I've described, with a, a strong adherence to the Constitution, with free markets, with informed citizens, with a strong civil society. We think that creates the most opportunity uh, for all Americans and a better life for all Americans. Brad, Bradley clearly has its, I think you, you have your own ide uh, uh, definition of what conservatism is. Yeah. I'm wondering if that matches up well with what the Republican Party Not is always. doing today. Not always. Not always? No. And no. you say that as a, as a guy around <laughs> as a the state Republican Party, party. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's sure, free trade. Sure, free trade, I think, is probably the best example, yeah. Mike, of, uh, uh, you know, the, the policy of this president has been with tariffs and, and so forth, and, and maybe there's a, a an end game that, that he has in mind that's not clear to all of us, but in general, we support free markets. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff that has been done doesn't, isn't necessarily consistent with that. But you probably agree with him on less regulation, something like totally that. Totally agree with him on less regulation um, and, and reducing the administrative state, the unelected administrative state, and returning 
Congress to the role that was intended by the founders as a co-equal branch of government, which uh, today they've abdicated a lot of that responsibility. So, so, so uh, there's a lot of what President Trump has done that we, we do agree with. There's some that we don't. So the, the Republican Party of today, is it, is it the same party? I mean, parties change a little bit over time, but is it the same party that you were once the head of here in the state of Wisconsin? Oh, I think over time the role of parties has, has changed. Um, it, it, it's more of a funding mechanism now in a lot of ways, both nationally and at the state level, than a, than a policy. Uh, oriented organization, and I think in a way that's too bad. Part of it could be the, the you know, the, I mean, in, in your business, the, the, the media world is just so different. Um, there, there's so much money that, that flies into politics that I think have, again, reduced the role of state, of state and national parties. So it, it, it's a different system. Um, I think it's probably natural that you'll, you, you long for the old days uh, in that kind of thing, but I don't think it's going to change. I'm wondering if you, uh, in your efforts to, I think, uh, promote a, a civil society, also worry about our discourse. That's something that, i got to be honest, as somebody who's covered politics a long time, it has changed, and, and it's been changing over time. Do you have concerns about that? It's really tough to have a, a, a conversation about a lot of topics these days. When you, when you see friends and you go to parties and so forth, oftentimes you just don't talk about those things. And I think that's, I think that's too bad. Um, in our own community, we talked about school choice. I mean, a very fragmented, I think Alan would agree, very fragmented conversation on that when it, it's an incredibly important topic. And, and discourse tends oftentimes not to be civil. Uh, you just look at the nightly news and, and you see the screaming that just yesterday went on between the Speaker of the House and the President. Come on. Um, it, it's, it's unfortunate. Now, our founding fathers squabbled with each other a lot too. So, On occasion. And, and, you yeah. know, and as I said, democracy's messy. Uh, I, I, I do have a sense that things are less civil, that there is less ability to work together today than there, there used to be, and I think that's unfortunate. I have to ask you a question or two about um, your experience as a U.S. ambassador. Um, you and I have talked about this before. I know you found it a very rewarding experience. Um, but my question is, are you concerned about how the U.S. is viewed in today's world? We, we have seen some, some decisions recently that, that actually members of both parties are questioning, um, and it's about what the U.S. really means. Is our word good? Are we people of integrity? Are you concerned as someone who has served this country in that capacity? I think you're talking about the Syria question. Right. And, and right. to just express my own personal view, foundation doesn't get into this stuff. I think the president was wrong uh, on that. Um, I do think we have to stand by our allies. I do think America has, has to have a, a leading role in the world. People do look to the United States for leadership and guidance. They don't always have to like the United States. Um, in a lot of cases won't, but they have to respect the United States. And the, and the United States can do a lot uh, for world order. I think back to my times in, in Prague as ambassador of a small country of 10 million people. Um, the people there always looked to what was going on in the United States. They paid very close attention to the politics of what was going on in the United States. We are leaders. We have to be leaders. Uh, and we can't abdicate that responsibility. Do you have concerns about our, our current relationship with Russia? You, uh, you know, as, as someone who was an ambassador in, in, in Europe, um, I think you have a sense of the, the dynamic that's at play there. Do you have concerns about how we're viewed in, sure. in that framework? Sure. Um, and of course, the Czech Republic was part of the old Soviet right. bloc. So I, I, I felt it very closely. And the, the issue that I worked on most uh, when I was in the Czech Republic, you recall that uh, George Bush wanted to put a missile defense system into the Czech Republic mm -hmm. and Poland to protect against uh, rockets coming out of Iran. 
Russians were violently opposed to it. So I, I was real engaged in that for those three years. Um, it's interesting, you look back at recent presidents, all of them, both parties, they all think that they can tame Vladimir Putin uh, and the Russians, and through a force of personality can bring about changes in that relationship. Uh, I'm of a view that Putin is an evil man. He hates the United States. He always will hate the United States. And, and the only way to play ball with Vladimir Putin is hardball. Um, we have to have a tough relationship with, with the Russians so long as that man is in charge um, because he's not going to change. Are those ambassador jobs um, rewarding, challenging? How would you describe your experience? Oh, it was, it was an incredible life-changing experience. And, and we have this system, as you know, in the United States of political appointees and career appointees. And obviously, I was a political appointee. I, I had no thoughts or idea that I would ever serve as an ambassador until one day they called and said, do you want to be an ambassador? And checked at home, and uh, before we knew it, we were in Prague. Uh, our son went to high school, younger son went to high school in, in Prague, an incredible experience for him. Our older son was in college, incredible experience. But just representing the United States, the greatest country on earth in a foreign country, was just an amazing, amazing experience. And it had nothing to do with politics, whether you're Republican or Democrat. Most of my job had nothing to do with that. It was representing the country. Um, and, and to be able to do that for, for those few years um, was amazing, it was amazing. And as I said, life-changing. And uh, uh, I wish more people could have had that experience. It, it, uh, um, to, to just to see h how this country is held in, in a country like that, where uh, they were dominated by the Soviets. And, and um, the, the, what happened, in fact, the ambassador who was in Prague when, at the time of the change, was Shirley Temple, Shirley Temple Black, as you'll, as you'll recall. Uh, and I had a chance to talk to her about, about those moments and, and the role that the United States played. Václav Havel the president of the Czech Republic used to sneak into the American residence in the back of a car to talk about freedom and democracy and, and a different way of life. Uh, and that's all about this country. It's all about America. It's pretty special. I'm going to take a few questions here in a moment, uh, maybe two final questions. So at one time there was speculation that you might run for political office. Is that something <laughs> you've got this long... I ask this of a lot of guests here, actually, um, what their political plans are. So I'll ask it of you, too. Um, you did think about it at one time. Oh, and I did. I, I ran for the state assembly in, what was it, yeah. about 1990 against now State Senator Alberta Darling, and I just got my clock cleaned. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was not close. Um, but I'm thinking about after that. <laughs> did, you, did you think about um, other things during the, you know, other possibilities? Um, yeah, I've given a little bit of thought to uh, to higher office, but I, I I'm not I don't think that's in the cards. Um, and particularly now doing what I'm doing, I've, I've probably eliminated any chance of uh, running for higher office. So no, I don't I don't think so. I, I had my taste of government um, working for the State Department, uh, and if I were to guess, that's probably it. That's an interesting comment you just made, that you probably, by doing what you're doing now, you've eliminated any chance. Probably, in, in today's polarized world. Yeah. That just you, can, you can imagine the ads that would yeah. run about the Bradley Foundation. <laughs> just having done that, you said that's a disqualifier <laughs> for you? Or is, so I'm doing really important things at Bradley, and I wouldn't change, trade that for the world. One thing I've been struck by, you've been doing a fair number of interviews like yeah. this, and yeah. uh, media appearances. <laughs> What's, what's the, the reason behind that? Um, Mike Greaves actually was at the law school, I think maybe when we were in the other building, uh, when he was the head of the foundation. Um, but I would say the foundation had a lower profile. The Mike yeah. was not a, a guy who, uh, you know, I think wanted to do a lot of the media spotlight right. stuff. Uh, right. It's always been that way. But you're intentionally setting out to do more of these. Why? I wish more people knew about the incredible things that the grantees that, that we support are able to do. I mean, the, the Bradley Foundation, our endowment, is an incredible gift from the Bradley brothers to this community, and, and I would argue to this country, but particularly to this community. And for people to understand that, that this wonderful endowment 
uh, it is there in large part or in significant part uh, to, to support making this a better city, whether it's through the arts, whether it's through the, the groups um, that we talked about, like the Alma Center or, or Community Warehouse or Running Rebels or, or the great schools uh, that, that are educating kids coming from tough backgrounds. That's a great gift, and, and we ought to celebrate the Bradleys and, and, and what they're able to do, and it's an incredible honor to be a steward of that for a short period of time. Let's take a, a few questions from the audience. As I do uh, at all these events, I ask you to keep your questions brief. We don't want speeches, if, if we can avoid that today. Um, we'll, uh, if you're in the back, Eric has a microphone. He'll hold the microphone for you. Um, and if you're in the front, if you're in the seating bowl down here, you can press down on the uh, black little device in front of you. Keep your finger down on that, and we'll all be able to hear your question. So if you have questions, raise them. We'll start here. And then we'll work our way back. Yes. And just keep your hand down on it. Yeah, As thanks. As a former grantee, I appreciated that the Bradley Foundation funded so many nonprofits in this community. And I agree that it probably is unknown how much good has been done. Uh, I, I wonder how you follow up on grantees to make sure they are producing the outcomes that they claim to in their grant requests. It's one of the great challenges I've found in, in the world of philanthropy is, is measurement. And, uh, and, and oftentimes when Bradley Foundation makes grants, unlike a lot of other foundations, it's for general operations. So Bradley is in effect saying, we trust you to spend this money how you think it should be spent best, as opposed to saying, we think you ought to spend it this way. Um, we, we get reports. We build relationships with people. Uh, coming out of the business world, there, there's a, an instinct to try to measure everything and, and require long reports and um, evaluations. Um, I'm, I'm finding that while that's helpful in some cases, in some cases you just can't measure. School choice, I think, is a, a good example. Um, if we had stopped funding because a particular school didn't measure up in a particular year, that probably would have been the wrong thing. You know, a lot of ways we're trying to change the world, and, and that can't happen in a week or so. So there has to be patience. There has to be a long-term view. But at the end of the day, it all boils down to respect and trust, oftentimes for one person, the person in that particular organization that has a passion, that's leading, that, that isn't in it, for the money or for the glory, but because they believe so fervently in the cause. And, and, and you can tell when you've met such a person. You can just tell. And that doesn't require any measurement. Other questions? Let me see here. I want to go. Go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, Hi. As a son of a factory worker at Allen Bradley, I asked this question. Really? Uh, you mentioned the brothers a lot, but I believe it was Jane Bradley Pettit that actually gave you the money. No, the foundation. no, it was no? not. No. Okay. It was not. Uh, uh, the, thanks Ms. for correcting me. Mrs. Pettit's funding was her own funding, for instance, the Bradley Center, okay. uh, which the Bradley Foundation had absolutely nothing to do with. Uh, so all of her funding was her own doing. It was okay. not through the foundation. Well, I, thank all. you for that. Uh, sure. My question, though, is she was famous for saying something to the effect that all the money was earned in Milwaukee and all the money shall stay in Milwaukee. And I'm just wondering, in light of uh, Mr. Borsick's recent column about Mike's father and the city being one of the poorest cities in America, really nothing, nothing much has changed in the city over the past 30 years. And I'm just wondering, why should not the foundation's money and their efforts stay in Milwaukee. So he's saying, you know, instead yeah, of why don't, why don't 30 spend, percent of it. Why don't we it, spend all our yeah, money? And, right. um, you know, I think it goes back to donor intent. And I, I think it goes back to what the Bradley brothers believed in, in, in limited government, in free markets, uh, in an informed citizenry. Uh, they believe strongly in Milwaukee, but they believe strongly in the country and in the United States. So I, I, I feel quite confident that the brothers would be happy with the direction, a strong, strong commitment to Milwaukee and Wisconsin, but also a national point of view. Other questions? Let me go back here. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, just keep your okay. hand down on it. Right. We'll get it. Um, you talked about the um, priority to strengthen civil society. Right. And you talked about um, the breakdown of the family. I want to ask you a two-part question regarding income inequality. And the first one is, considering how you define income inequality today, how much does that undermine your efforts to strengthen civil society? And the second part is, if the current course continues as we know it today, what does your picture of civil society look like 20 years from now in terms of this problem of income inequality? I'm not sure I look at the, the problem the same way. I mean, sh sure there is inequality among income, but what, what I think the Bradley brothers would look for was how do we create an environment where everyone has an opportunity to do what they want with that opportunity, has a good education, um, it, it is part of a, you know, a strong family or a strong civil society. Now, I mean, no one ever intended in this society that everyone be absolutely equal. That, that's what America's all about. It's opportunity and, and people taking chances and failing and having the opportunity to try again. Um, what we need to do is get a perf a more, to a more perfect world would be one in which everyone, every kid is great, getting a great education. Everyone is, is growing up in a strong community. Uh, so, I mean, strengthening, protecting those institutions of civil society, I think, should be a goal. And is it easy? Is it going to happen overnight? Will we ever get there in a perfect world? Of course not. Uh, but the opportunity that exists in this country is still better than any other place on this planet. And the opportunities to succeed in this country are better than anywhere else in this planet. Uh, so I tend to look at things with a glass half full, that we have a great country. We've got a lot of work to do on our country. We've got a lot of coming together as a, as a society, but it's still the greatest, best place on earth. Other questions? I'll go back here. You've got the brewer's hat on. There you go. It's a rough last game, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it was. One of the things I find troubling in our society today is the lack of civility in our, in our politics. And you see this so much in the media and you see the polarization, in especially like in secular academia and a division in the media. And the reason I'm bringing this up is you have people who do what you do on a national level like the Koch brothers, and they automatically get demonized when they give their money. Uh, as if to say, well, you're giving your money to conservative causes, therefore you're automatically bad or evil. And then you have, but you people, they ignore on the, the, on the other side, people like George Soros in Hollywood who give tons and tons and tons of money and they get applauded. And, and so I, there, there's this disparity. It's almost like our, if you're conservative and giving money, it's almost like you're uh, Darth Vader or, or Lex Luthor. What are you doing with your evil conservative money? And over here it's, what are you doing with your wonderful good liberal money? And I don't have a problem with anyone being liberal. That's your choice, but what I'm saying in our society, there's a clear difference in terms of how our media and in academia, how they present people who, like, uh, who uh, on one side give money, conservative, you're automatically demonized. Uh, and and um, to me, that, it, that goes to the, the lack of civility in our society. Well, and, we talked about that yeah. earlier, and, well, I, and I just, maybe, maybe it's events like this where, I mean, I, I suspect we have people with all kinds of different views here today. Uh, that's okay, and, and we're having a very civil conversation. Uh, we need more of that uh, throughout the country. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it gets frustrating. There seem to be double standards. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it happens both ways, to be honest. Other questions? On the, uh, okay, go ahead. Yes. I don't, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Um, so I have kind of like two questions. One is, I'd like to understand what you, what you mean when you talk about the breakdown of the family as leading to problems in our society. What, is, what does that mean to you? And then the second part of that is that if you support educational choices, Yes. 
then I wonder why you wouldn't put money toward the public school. I know she didn't. <laughs> uh, we, 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 think the, we think the opportunities right now are for more parent choice. And the more choices parents have, the better for their kids. Uh, we can spend our money, obviously, any way we want. That, that's part of the beauty in this country. Uh, and we think that those places where we put money are the places where kids have the best chance of, of growing and uh, ending up as contributing citizens to our society. We think those are the best opportunities for change and improvement in our community. Um, and the results are starting to bear that out. When you, when you ask your question about family breakdown, I don't think it's a secret uh, that, that there are problems uh, across the country and in our community with uh, single, single family, single parent families, uh, with kids that don't have a father figure uh, involved in their lives. And um, that's something that we think needs to be worked on. Okay. So you think, you think it's better just having a single parent family? I think if you're going to give parents choices, yeah. then you strengthen all the educational um, institutions. Well, I've said so, four times that I'm not against public education. I, I, I'm for a I strong public that. education. I understood that. I, I think you And also, the taxpayers are paying for that. Well, yes and no. Um, and do I don't think the choice of a two-parent family uh, then you end up with one parent. That's all, you know, there are multiple kinds of families. And um, I kind of resent that you talk about the breakdown of the family as a cause for our civil ills. Um, so I would have to understand how you support all families not you personally, the Bradley's Foundation. We should probably move on, but, but in just in one sentence, sure. we think stronger families make for stronger communities, make for a more civil society. Other questions? Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for being here. Hi. Um, I may not be current on this, so please correct me if I'm not, but I'm under the impression that voucher schools are not required to do the same standardized testing as public schools. And if that is true, then I'd like you to perhaps revisit what you said about test results. Uh, what I said was test results are uh, a factor. They shouldn't be the only factor uh, in evaluating schools. I think there's a tendency to look just at test scores, and I don't think that's fair. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. There's, there's a school affiliated, fairly new school affiliated with the Milwaukee Rescue Mission. It's called Cross Trainers Academy. Um, the test scores in that school, and, the, and these are kids that are, are largely coming from homeless families. Um, the test scores in that school are, aren't going to be at the top of the state in the first year, the second year, or the tenth year. But the work that that school is doing to, to give a good education to kids coming out of a desperate situation is, is really pretty amazing. Um, th th those kids will have a, a shot at going to college and, and breaking a cycle of poverty um, and staying clean in terms of out of the justice system. So, while test scores are convenient and nice and important, my point is they shouldn't be the only factor in evaluating whether a school is performing well and performing a service to the community. I very, much, I very much agree, but I am just curious. Are voucher schools required to do the same standardized testing? Jason, as public are schools? voucher schools required to do the same sort of testing, Ricardo? Uh, they are? Far be it for me to uh, take sides on anything. I'm Alan Borsick. Um, <laughs> as a factual matter, for, since about 2010, voucher schools take the same tests as public schools. The results are released 
I or anybody has access to them in pretty rich details. Very rich detail, the same as for a public school. In the case of charter schools, pretty good detail with voucher schools. But they take the same tests. The results are public. There's no huge secrets about how they're doing. Thanks, Alan. A couple of other quick questions, and then we'll wrap things up. I'll come over here in just a second, but let's go over here, and then I'll come right back. Um, I want to kind of bookend the very first question about um, how you measure outcomes. You must get many proposals for support from all of the, you, like you mentioned, the Alma Center, and I'm thinking of Pathfinders and Guest House, all these really terrific small um, um, Nonprofits. Thank you. And so, how do you do your diligence in determining who's going to get the funding? It's hard. I mean, we, we have a team. Uh, I mean, the Bradley Foundation really does two things it manages its endowment and it vets applications and makes recommendations to, to our board of directors. And every single application that comes in is reviewed and uh, assessed. Uh, you're right, we get many, many, many. Uh, applications. Um, some ways maybe it's easier to measure things here at home because you're closer and you have uh, more familiarity uh, uh, with it, uh, but it's not an exact science. You do your best and then we go back often and, and look about, look at our, our plan, uh, look at our donor intent, uh, and what we are constantly asking ourselves is, does this further Donor intent. Is this what the Bradley brothers would have wanted, would have done? And, and yes, there are some terrific organizations and causes that are great with good leadership that we will end up declining because it just doesn't fit with what we're trying to do. You can't do everything. We have limited resources. And when you try to do everything, you end up doing nothing. But it, it's hard. It's a hard process. Final question. We've got about two minutes left. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Being here, uh, I'm going to try and be as civil as I possibly can. Here. And I will. We, we too. like that. We like that. <laughs> um, I have to totally beg to differ with you on your stance on school choice. Um, my question is: Does the Bradley Foundation ever send some of your people to actually go visit some of these voucher schools? Absolutely. And I say that because. It sounds very good and honorable to say parents know what's best for their kids, but when you have a parent who is uneducated, low income, who is not aware of the options that are available to them or doesn't know how to research these schools, I don't see them as being in a position to make the best choice for their child. And when it comes to these voucher schools, people always tout Mesmer and St. Marcus and a few others. Uh, but I think that somebody or a team from your organization should go and visit these schools because I personally would not send my puppy to these voucher schools, okay? And that's due to the quality of uh, the teachers as well as the lack of supplies and the materials needed in order for our kids to get a good education. So again, my question is, do you ever visit these schools? All the time, um, per personally. Okay. Personally, I have so, been to many, oh. many of the schools, virtually all of the schools that the Bradley Foundation funds. I've spent the better part of a day with the leadership of those schools, talking to the kids in those schools. So the answer is absolutely yes, I have. Your question on, on are parents capable? I think every single person is capable. I do think we have, a, and, and some on high authority, uh, I will argue, is not better than a parent. Uh, in, in making those decisions. Um, do we need better and more information for parents to make those decisions? Sure. Do we need more, better administrators in all schools? Yes. Do schools need better facilities? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, before we go, um, I'm going to uh, talk about some things that are going on next week. Uh, we have Busy week next week here at the law school. Uh, we've got a, a national poll that will be released on Monday uh, looking at public attitudes towards the U.S. Supreme Court. That will be a half-day conference. Uh, we're sold out for that. The next day, Carl Holtz, the uh, Washington, chief Washington correspondent for the New York Times, 
uh, will be here. He'll be talking about his new book, Confirmation Bias, which looks at the, uh, the increasing uh, political battles that we're having over Supreme Court nominees. And uh, that, too, I think, is sold out, as best I understand it. But Wednesday, we do have seats available for our next Marquette University Law School poll looking at state politics. That will come out on Wednesday. Charles Franklin, the poll director, will be here with me. So if you want to attend that, we've got seats available. We'd love to have you. Again, thank you so much for your time, your interest, your attention. And thanks most of all thank you to Rick Raymond. Thank you, sir.